Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live community classroom of Michael's. We have our friend Tamara Kelly with us here today to learn how to make a spring inspired crochet bucket hat. My name is Laura Kay from Your Inspirations, and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat, and we'll make sure that Tamara or me answers them. While we're ready to kick things off, you're already letting us know where you are. Keep doing that and uh, letting us know where you're watching from. All right. Thank you so much. I will pass it on to Tamara. All right. Thank you both so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamara from Moogly, and I am here with Yarn Inspirations today to help you get your head ready for summer. We all need that super trendy bucket hat right now. And Yarn Inspirations has one in one of their beautiful new Karen cakes. So right here, I have the let me get the name exactly right. The Karen Fuzzy Stripes Crochet Bucket Hat. Now, this is a free pattern you'll find on yarnspirations.com. So I'll, of course, be linking it here in the chat while the class is live. But if you're watching afterwards on the Michaels YouTube channel, you'll find it on Yarnspirations. If you just go to their search bar and type in bucket hat, it should be one of the beautiful options that pops right up. Now, you can see, hopefully on the screen already, that this one's got some fuzz to it, right? It's got a little bit of little bits sticking out. And that is very intentional. It's nothing. I haven't worn this hat way too much. This is Karen Coconut Cakes. This is one of the beautiful cakes you will find out right now in your Michaels stores, as well as on michaels.com online. And you can see it's got those little fuzzies built in. Now, if you're an experienced crocheter, knitter, crafter. You may have used yarn with this sort of look before, and you might not have liked it. You might have found it difficult to frog. You might have found it rough to the touch. None of those apply to Karen coconut cakes. I can tell you, I was personally surprised when I reached out and touched this for the first time. These fuzzies are not in any way sharp or rough and actually playing with it a little bit. I've been crocheting with it a little bit earlier today. It even frogs beautifully, meaning the stitches just pull right out. It doesn't get tangled on those little bits. They don't feel rough to the touch, even those most sensitive areas. It feels really good. So once again, that's the yarn we're using today, Karen Coconut Cakes. I do recommend if you've got it in your store, Go give it a feel. I think you'll really love it. It's actually a 78% cotton, 22% polyester, which makes it perfect for a hat for the summer. So I'm going to go ahead and set these off to the side a little bit here, and we'll switch over to the hand camera and get to work. All righty. So there is a picture of the pattern we're following today, the Karen Fuzzy Stripes Crochet Bucket Hat. Let me get my camera a little straightened out. There we are. So we are using Karen Coconut Cake. And you can see, it's a little harder to see in the picture here. It's actually easier to see in the hat. The original uses three different colors, one, two, and three. Now, if you wanted to, you could probably get, I'm doing a quick little quick math here in my head. You could absolutely get a full hat out of just one cake if you wanted to make it all the same color. So you could do multiple colors. You could do one color, whatever you like to do. This is designed to fit adults. So this is sort of a one size fits most hat. And it's got a pretty good stretch to it too. If I hold it up here, you can see there's a fair bit of stretch. This will fit pretty much everybody 13 years old or so on up. I know it says adults, but by the time kids are 13 or so, they usually have about an adult sized head. So I'm going to be using today. Let's see. This is the, I'm going to get it just right here. This is the, oh, I still had it upside down, the blueberry sorbet. There it is, the blueberry sorbet colorway. Really pretty one. It's got some little bit of yellow in there as well. And one thing about this yarn, in addition to the fuzz, you can see the strand itself has a bit of a ply or a twist to it like that. So you've got all those colors running through every section of the yarn. Now this does have one little downside or upside, depending on how you look at it, it makes finding your individual stitches a little bit more difficult. If I hold this up here, we're actually working from the top down. So we'd be working this direction. And you can see them here, but especially at the top, when you're just beginning, it can be a little difficult to pick out those individual stitches. So an extra tool that can be really helpful is stitch markers. I have a bunch of them right here. If you don't have a stitch marker, you can use a scrap of um, a contrasting color of yarn works really well but we're going to want to really use these to mark the first and last stitch of each round. This will help us count our stitches. It will help us keep our place, not accidentally work into the slip knot or excuse me, the slip stitch, which is a really easy thing to do when you are crocheting in the round. 
and it just makes things a little bit easier. So to begin, um, oh, in addition to our <laughs> yarn, I should, of course, mention our hook. I am using a Susan Bates twist and lock. This pattern calls for a 4.5 millimeter crochet hook. That is a pretty unusual size. And when I was going through my collection, I realized I didn't have one that I could use for this class today. So if you're like me and you don't have a 4.5 on hand, then a five millimeter is a perfectly good substitute. All righty, so now let's begin. Our instructions have a couple of notes that we need to pay attention to. We join all rounds with a slip stitch to the first stitch, pretty standard, but also the chain two does not count as a stitch. That means we're not going to be crocheting into those chains at all. So to begin, we'll start by putting a slip knot on our hook. There we go. And I'm going to start with a chain of three. So get that yarned over there. One, two, and three. Now, this chain three is also not going to count as our first stitch because we're going to be making our stitches into the first chain we made, the one right back here by the slip knot. And that just leaves those two chains right there. So those are going to be basically our little turning chain, but they're not going to count as a stitch. So after we've got our chain three, we begin our first round by working 10 half double crochets into the third chain from the hook, that very first chain we made. So we yarn over and go right into that chain. Now, how you go into that chain, which loops you go under, is really totally up to you. Because we're working in the round, we're going to basically go all the way around it. So it really doesn't matter what angle you like to enter it from. Totally personal preference. So what I'm going to do is now that I've made one half double crochet, into that first chain right there, let me pull that a little bit closer there. I'm going to pause for a moment and grab my stitch marker. There it is. I'm going to put my stitch marker right in the top of that first stitch. See with those multiple colors, how it's a little more difficult to see the parts of the stitch. This is where those stitch markers come in really handy. Because now as I come back around, I'll know right where to put my slip stitch to finish off round one. So now I'm going to yarn over and go right back in that same spot and do another half double crochet. We want to have a total of 10. There's two, three, and I'm going to stop counting out loud so that uh, I don't mess up any of your stitch counts when we're trying to crochet along at the same time. Now that I've done a few of them, you can see how it's curving around inside that chain and I've kind of come up to where that slip knot is. You can just push that out of the way right there and come in on the other side of the chain. You can just weave that in when you're all done, like just like you would any other end. And then we can continue to go around. Now, for some reason, if you finish this round and you find that the hole in the middle is a little too big for you, that chain just opened up too big, then make sure when you weave in this end, take your yarn needle and you can close that up before you finish weaving in that end. I'm always a big fan of if you've got ends to weave in, you can put them to use a little bit. All right, so now that since I haven't been counting, we're going to need to stop and count and see where I'm at. This is again, we're having that stitch marker makes it so much easier to find that first stitch. I'm not sitting here trying to look at all this and figure out where that round actually begins. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I need to do two more. There we go. We yarn over, go right back into that same spot. One, and I need one more. There we go. All righty. So this is Almost at the end of round one, I still need to slip stitch the first stitch. You can see that first chain opened up just a little bit. We can always take that tail. And when we go to weave it in, just go back and forth around that circle to really close it up if you'd like. So to finish that up, we just put our slip stitch right in that first stitch. Now, this is optional. I do always recommend you put that slip stitch in the, or excuse me, stitch marker in the first stitch. But I'm also, because this yarn has so much variation to it and so much color to it, I'm going to put a stitch marker right in that last stitch as well. This way, as I go around, I'll always know when I come to the last stitch and I won't accidentally work into the slip stitch that we'll use to close each stitch. So now with the first stitch and the last stitch marked, and go ahead and slip stitch to that very first stitch, just like that. So. No, it's early days. 
pretty simple so far, but are there any questions I can ask from the comments? Or answer, I should say. <laughs> I'm trying to answer the questions, not ask so many. Okay. All right, I'm going to take that as a no. So um, Renee and Laura, if you guys spot some, do you let me know? All righty, so let's move on to our second round. Looking at our instructions in the written pattern, for round two, we start with a chain two and then work two half double crochets in each stitch around for a total of 20. A pretty standard increase in half double crochet to make our nice flat circle for the top of our hat. Now, this is again where this chain two is just acting as a turning chain. It's not an actual stitch. Since we don't wanna stitch into it, I like to make those uh, that chain two kind of tight little chains. because so I don't need to work back into them at all. And I find if I make them loosely, they're a little too tall. They're a little bit taller than my half double crochets are. However, if I make just one chain, it tends to be a little short. So if you find this to be true for yourself as well, you'll want to either chain one and just make it a little bit taller or chain two and try and make them a little bit shorter. Again, we don't have to stitch back into it, so it doesn't matter if it's a little tight. After that, we can start working right into that first marked stitch, the same one we slip stitch to. I'm gonna put one half double crochet in there. There we go. And again, since this is the first stitch of the round, I want to move that stitch marker right on up. Just grab the one from the stitch we worked into and put it right in the top of that first stitch right there. Then we work another half double crochet right into that same stitch. There we go. So if you haven't increased before, and I've had people ask me this on my YouTube channel and other places, you know, what does that mean? Go right back in that same stitch? Yes, absolutely. Just like we put 10 half double crochets in that one chain, we can keep putting stitches in a stitch as long as they'll fit. And you can absolutely do two. So we go right into that stitch, let's get a little closer. Got that one right in there. We're gonna go right back in that same spot. Two half double crochets in that same stitch. And we wanna do that all the way around. So that means if we had 10 half double crochets in round one, we should have 20 in round two. Sometimes the tail wants to try and join the party there and just push it on out of the way. And you can go ahead and weave in that first end right now if you'd like. I tend to usually wait until I'm a few rounds into a project just in case I discover I've made a big mistake and I want to pull it all out. One of the joys of crochet, of course, is that if you make a mistake, you can pull it all out. It's not like some other supplies where they're sort of used up. And this yarn really does frog beautifully. It pulls out really nicely. It doesn't get snagged. All those little bits, when I first saw it, I thought it was going to be quite difficult to frog, but it is not. It is, as you can see here, it slides right along the hook. It doesn't snap, you know, get caught on it at all. It's not getting caught on itself. I'm not having trouble pulling those loops up and through. They're gliding through really, really nicely. So now as I work my right way around, I could have been counting all those stitches, always a good idea, but easy peasy, I've got my next stitch with a stitch marker in it. I know this next stitch is the last one. So I can go right in there and I'll put one and then two. I don't want to mark the first one I put in here because I'm marking the last stitch of this round. So now that I've made my second one, I'll go ahead, pull that loop up. I always like to just secure the loop on my finger so it doesn't pull out. There we go. Put that stitch marker right in the top of that very last stitch. And now we know we're ready to join with a slip stitch. If you'd like, you can always go back and count your stitches. You'll know right where to begin and right where to end. And we know right where to slip stitch because we've got that marked as well. There we go. So our nice flat circle is proceeding and we're through round two. But, uh, let's see, were there any questions about rounds one or two, Renee or Laura? Um, I'm not seeing anything just yet, but okay. if y'all have questions, just drop them in the chat. Right. Um, and it's easiest if you address it to everybody, because then when we answer, um, if we answer over messaging, then everyone gets to see the answer and it might be helpful for them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's a great tip. Yeah. So odds are, if you have a question, somebody else does too. So don't be afraid to ask. 
All righty. So let's move on to round three. Round three, very similar. We're continuing in our flat circle. So if you haven't crocheted a flat circle before, um, this is a great demonstration of sort of the math of it. We double our stitches in round one, uh, round two. So we start with round one, whatever number we've got there, double it for round two, which means say we had six there, it would be 12. We'd want to increase by six every round to keep it flat. Since we started with 10, we want to increase by 10 every round to keep it flat. So if we had 10 in the first round, 20 in the second round, we'll want 30 in our third round. And that is what our instructions calls for. So in order to make that happen, we start again with our chain of two. I'm going to keep those tight. Remember, I'm not working into those. So we want them to be a little bit shorter than a chain two might otherwise be. Then we begin the repeat that we do. So if you're following along with the written instructions, this is the section that begins with an asterisk. When it starts with an asterisk, it means we're going to come back to that point and begin that sequence over and over again. So we start with one half double crochet in the next one. So that means our first one, one half double crochet in the first stitch. That's our marked stitch. So as soon as I have that made, I'm going to move that stitch marker on up. I see somebody ask about the stitch markers. Yes, these are the stitch pins, the Crystallite stitch pins from Susan Bates. There we are. All right, so I just move that right up to the top of our first stitch here. There we go. And, you know, whatever type of stitch markers you use, just sorry, little note about those. The main thing is for crochet, you want to make sure they open. So some might look like a little ring, but as long as they've got an opening, they're fine for crochet. The fully closed ring stitch markers are just for knitting because those actually go on the needles, not the yarn. With crochet, they go on the yarn. So they want to be able to open so you can get them back off. All righty. So there's our first stitch. To continue our repeat, we work two half double crochets in the next stitch. So one in the first stitch, two in the next. One and two. There we go. Then that's the end of our repeat. We go right back to that asterisk, which means one half double crochet in the next stitch. Pull up a little bit more yarn here. Then two half double crochets in the stitch after that. One and two. So we're increasing now, putting two stitches into one stitch every other stitch. So if we've done two in that stitch, we know we need to put one in the next and then two in the stitch after that. One and two. Then begin again, one in the next stitch, two in the stitch after that, one and two. Oh, that tail still trying to join the party. There we go. You can see we're almost halfway around. Just take your time. I only have an hour with you today, but you have all the time you need to make this hat. So do not worry about keeping caught up if you're not moving quite this fast. At some point today in our lesson, I'm going to skip ahead anyway. So take your time with your stitches. Let's see, got a little fuzzy spot. Let me get that off of there. I don't know about you guys, but I always, I always end up with a little bit of hair in my projects. Occasionally fuzzies from what I was wearing. There we go. One and two. So if you ever get lost and you say, oh gosh, I lost track of where I was. I had to put my project down, take care of the kids and come back to it. You can look really closely and see, oh, there's a stitch with two stitches worked into it. There's one in that one. That means we've got two in that one. We're on round three, we go right back to one in the next stitch, and then two in the stitch after that. Oh, I dropped my loop. There we are. And back to that one. So there's one and two. There we go. And one and two. And we just continue that all the way around. Now, a question I often get is what I think of these hooks. And I will tell you right now, as we just finish up this round, that I do enjoy them very much. 
I like the handle. It is quite round. It makes it a little easier to keep my hand relaxed. So if you are someone who is having a lot of hand trouble, uh, you know, if you're crocheting for long periods of time, the number one key is to relax. Try and relax your hands, your shoulders, and your elbows. Um, but also try using a hook with a thicker handle. All right. <laughs> Little chat to get us around our round here. We are at our final marked stitch. That means it's our last stitch. We're going to work two half double crochets in there because that was the last bit of our repeat. So with that second one, now I can move that stitch marker right on up. Now I've mentioned I like to drop my the loop over my finger like this to hold it secure so it doesn't pull out while I'm moving things around and putting my stitch markers in. But I also, if you may have noticed, drop my hook over my finger like this directly off the hook. It keeps the loop, the active loop from twisting. Uh, if you find that sometimes your stitches just look a little twisted, like they're just not quite laying right, it might be that you put the hook back in the other way. So a quick way to check that if you have put it down and taken your hook out of your project is when you put your hook back in your loop and you pull down on the strand going back into the skein, then the part that moves, the part of the loop that moves should be in front of your hook. Let me turn this way. It's a little easier to see when I pull down on that. You see how it's going down into the stitch in front of my hook, the side towards me. That means it is on the hook the correct way. If it's the loop portion of the loop in back that's moving down into the stitch, then you need to flip your loop around. And that was just a little tip to help your stitches make a little bit better. Now, I did see one question pop up, but I didn't catch quite all of it. So I'm going to put my slip stitch in here. Uh, Renee or Laura, if one of you could help me with that. Um, yeah, we had a question from Malaysia Gray, and she said, what happens if your count is wrong? Does it change the shape of your hat? Um, well, Yes and no. It depends uh, how many stitches you start out with. If you started out with 10, then you need to add 10 every round or it won't stay flat. It will start to, well, if there's not enough stitches, it will start to cup or bowl, which eventually we want to do, right? Because we're turning it into a hat. It'll just start to do it a little too early. If you've got too many stitches, it might ruffle. Um, it's kind of hard to show here, but when you have too many stitches in a space, if it's starting to ruffle a little bit like that along the edge, that's a sign that you've got too many. Like I said, one of the great things about crochet, of course, is if you have had made a mistake, if you don't have the right stitch count, you can always just pull it out and do it again. So using those stitch markers, I will tell you, I struggled for years. I was very stubborn when I was a new crocheter, very, very stubborn. And I didn't want to invest in stitch markers. I thought they were an extra thing I could definitely live without. And I could, but I will tell you, they have saved me so much time and mental anguish since then. Um, I just, I've, I've called myself a little bit the stitch marker evangel evangelist. I can't say the word. I've got to stop calling myself that. But uh, I really feel like they are just such a boon that after the yarn and the hook, they should be probably the next purchase on your crochet journey. Um, it really will help you keep your stitch count. And if you're somebody who struggles with those repeats, you can use lots of stitch markers. You don't just have to use them on the first and last stitch. You could say, put them every time you go back to one half double crochet by itself, go ahead and mark that one. And that will help you count your stitches as well. If you're a very beginner, it might even help to mark the top of every stitch while you're really learning that stitch anatomy. Alrighty, so let's move on here. Um, I think at this point, what I want to do is stop talking about the top of the hat, which is our color A portion and move on to the next section so I can cover the unique stitch used there. So let's go back to our written pattern here. Again, this one is the Karen Fuzzy Stripes Crochet Bucket Hat, which is a free pattern on yarnspirations.com. But if we come back down here to our written instructions, we've worked all the way through round three here. You can see there's the 30 half double crochet. That's our stitch count at the end. And when you keep working, then you just keep making those increases. So for round four, it's half double crochet in the first two stitches, then an increase. Again, we're just adding 10 stitches to each round. So those increases will just move a little further and further apart with an extra stitch in between. You can just read right along there. It's just what we've been doing. Chain two, half double crochet in the next two, two half double crochets in the next stitch, just like that. So fifth 
sixth, seventh, eighth rounds are all the top of a hat. You can see here, we're just increasing every round, 50, 60, 70. The eighth round, not quite as many. We've got a little bit more space there. If you look at it, you can see one half double crochet in 13 stitches before an increase. That brings us to 75 half double crochets. And then we're ready to join color B. And joining color B is a little different because we're going to be working in the back loops only with a half double crochet in each stitch around. So when we switch to color B, we're no longer increasing. Let's look back at our hat here so you can see what I'm talking about. Now remember, we're working from the top down as we're making our hat. So those first few rounds we've been working here are this flat circle right at the top of the hat. These are the nice increases, 10 stitches almost every round, just five stitches out on that very last round. Then we switch to our next color. And if you look here, you can see there's that little ridge right there. This is created by working with this color into the back loop only. This is the front loop. And this is just a tiny little detail. It's optional. If you don't like it, you can crochet through both loops. But I think it gives a really nice sort of finished edge to the color change. And we see that again when we switch to the third color for the brim right here. A little harder to see with this color. But you can see there is that unused front loop. So it just creates a little bit of an extra line of separation between those colors. But again, if you don't like it, it's totally optional. So let's go ahead and come over here and pretend for an instant that we've finished our hat or maybe we're a teeny tiny little version for like an American Girl doll or something. And we'll go ahead and break our yarn. I've already joined with a slip stitch there. I'm just going to go ahead and cut my yarn. Now, whenever you cut yarn, especially worsted, bulky weight, you really want to leave four to six inches at the end so you can weave it in with a yarn needle. Um, this is going to give you a much better finish. A lot of people like to just crochet over those ends. And for some projects that might work, but eventually with, with wash and wear, that end may work its way back out. So you'll want to use some sort of yarn needle to really weave that end in. Tamara, so though, sorry oh, to ahead. pop in, but before we move yeah. on, um, we did have a question from Terry saying, when you move your marker up, should the next row's stitch be directly above the lower first stitch? So sorry, just didn't want to no, move on too far. <laughs> absolutely. No, that's a great question. Let me see. Again, this yarn makes it a little bit more difficult to see just because it's got multiple colors. But let's see if we can kind of pull apart here. This is a marked stitch. And if we follow the body of it down right here, it is worked into this stitch. So this is the stitch that would have been marked before. So when you're work marking a stitch, it should be in the stitch that was previously marked. That's why I always um, work that stitch into that marked stitch and then immediately move that stitch marker up. So if you work, work into the marked stitch, so you just have to kind of move that stitch marker aside and then move it up. Now, the nature of crochet is that, especially when you're working in the round, if you're right-handed, your seam or your join, if you will, is going to shift slightly to the right. So that stitch marker might seem to be just slightly off to the right. If you're left-handed, it might be slightly off to the left. So there will be a little bit of an angle to that seam, if you will. Don't know if we can see it in this hat or they did such a good job. Yeah, I really, I would have to sit here for probably far too long to find the seam in this hat. It really is well hidden, but um, let's see. Whoop. Let me get focused back in here. Let's say this was my marked stitch. It's a little easier to see in this color. That's the stitch right underneath. That would have been the one that was marked before. And you can see how this one's slightly off to the right. So it's above it. And we do talk about it being right above it. But the nature of crochet, it's just going to shift a little bit. Again, most of us are right-handed to the right. If you're left-handed, a little bit to the left. Because, of course, you're working the opposite direction. Um, I hope that helps. Okay. Any other uh, follow-up questions or anything along those lines that I could help with? All good. I think Malaysia said, I see the same thing on mine. Okay, it's good. Laughing good, good. Emoji. Yes, good. So yeah, it's like I say, it's your right hand a little to right, left hand a little to the left, but that lean is when you're working in the round is just part of crochet, the physics of it, if you will. So 
So I'm going to go ahead and pull in my second color here. Now I got lucky. I was had a pretty easy time finding this center pull. And one of the fun things about cakes, uh, Karen, coconut cakes included, is that you, they can be a center pull cake, which is nice because then the whole thing sits right here on the table. And you can just work your yarn right out of it. That said, if you are having trouble, if you're just not finding your center pull on these cakes, feel free to pull the label off and work from the outside. It's still going to sit really nicely on the table. Might spin a little bit, but it's not going to probably, unless you're crocheting like, you know, super, super fast, it's not going to go flying or anything. And with this yarn, it won't make a difference. It doesn't have a color gradient or anything like that. So you can pull from whatever end is easiest for you to find. So I'll pull up just a couple yards here for me to work with. And let's move on to, and I'm going to have to, you know, change the stitch counts here a little bit for the sake of time. We're going to move on to round nine, which is the one we work with color B. So whatever your color B needs to be. So I am going to take this guy right here. And one thing I like to do is I like to actually move my seams. I'm joining in a new color here. I could join it in our first marked stitch and sort of keep that same seam but I like to move around a little bit. One of the reasons I like to do this is because it keeps it all from lining up throughout the hat. And that can be an advantage because when it's all lined up like that, it's easier for the eye to spot. It's easier for the naked eye to see. By moving it around, it makes it a little harder for it to find. So it's going to make it just that little bit less obvious, even, even more or less obvious to those who aren't actually young know, crocheters. We're gonna spot it long before anybody else. So. Go ahead and pick a spot anywhere on your hat. Now I am going to leave these in here because they're going to tell me not to work into that slip stitch. They're gonna let me know that's a slip stitch, not a stitch. I'll have a couple more stitch markers ready to go. So I'm just going to pick a spot on the hat. I'm going to insert my hook, but I'm going to go under the back loop only. So let's look really closely at those stitches we made on our previous round. Now on your full size hat, obviously we'll have quite a few more rounds here in a bigger circle, but the tops of all your stitches should have these two loops, right? The two loops we usually crochet under, the V at the top of every stitch. The front loop is the loop that's closest to you, the crocheter. The back loop is the one that's furthest away. It's always relative to you. It's not inherent to the crochet itself. So if I were to flip this over for some reason and I wanted to crochet from this angle, now this is the front loop, and this is the back loop. Again, it's all about where I am in relation to the crochet, not about the crochet itself. So when I want to crochet under the back loop only, I'll put my hook right in the center, right between those two Vs. Let me pick this one because it's a little easier to see here. And I just go right under just that back loop. Now, normally when we crochet, we go under both loops. Right now, we wanna go under just the back loop. That's what's going to leave that front loop free and give us that really great little ridge. You can see it's just hanging off my hook, no big deal. I can get that sort of, let that hang out there while I get my next yarn ready to go, settled around my fingers. And then I'm just going to yarn over and pull that loop through. Now you'll see, I'm still holding on to that tail end there with the pinky of my hook hand. We don't wanna just let it be loose. I wanna give it a little bit of control there. So we've got our loop pulled through that back loop only. I'm gonna go ahead and make those two really tight chains, one and two for our turning chain. And now I can just let that tail go and I'll weave it in when I weave in the rest of my ends for the hat. So now we're attached, we're ready to go back to our instructions for the ninth round. We've made our chain two, we're working in the back loops only, and now we can half double crochet in each stitch around. So right now we're going to be working evenly. If we go back to our finished hat, one-handed here, you can kind of see our top came out and this is where we're working straight down. This is going to really start giving us our hat shape because right now it should look kind of like a flat circle, more like a plate. So we're going to half double crochet in each stitch around. That means we go right back into that stitch we joined to. There we go. Now, since that's our first half double crochet, I'm going to put a stitch marker in it. Like I say, I find that these save me so much time and mental effort at the end of the day. Then 
we just go right on to the next stitch. No repeats for this one, just a half double crochet in each stitch. The main thing is you want to make sure you get just that back loop. There we are. And then just half double crochet in each stitch around. So at the end of round eight, you ended with 75 half double crochets. I had to go back and check there. That means in each of these rounds of this color B section, you should also have 75 stitches. Now, if somehow you have gotten to this point and you've worked it out, and you've broken your color A and you've woven in their ends and you go back and count your stitches and maybe you've got 74 or maybe you've got 75, uh, maybe or 75 is correct, but maybe you've got 76. You can do a sneaky decrease or you can just include it and have it a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger. That one stitch might not make a size difference. And then you can try and account for it in the next section where we start increasing again. So if, because someone asked earlier about stitch counts, I just wanna say, if you've already broken your yarn and woven in your ends here for section one and you find off, find out your one stitch off, it probably won't affect the fit of the hat. And you can just work evenly for this section and then you can always fudge it in the brim a little bit or include it. Hey, Tim, real quick. Oh, yes. Sorry. Oh, no, please. There's just one more quick question from the chat um, mm -hmm. from Terry. Uh, where do you put the stitch marker? It seems you put it in the V. Uh, yes, I put it under the top two loops of the stitch. The same place that I would put my hook is where I would put my stitch marker. Um, couple reasons. It's, you know, right at the top of the stitch. So it's easy to see, although I picked the wrong color there, didn't I? Let's try a blue one. There we go. A little easier to see. But also it gives me, you know, it tells me right where I want to put my hook. If I come back around and slip stitch, I know right where my stitch marker is. It's also really great uh, when, like in this case, we, for instance, we've got our chain two that doesn't count as a stitch. For other patterns, you might have a turning chain that does count as a stitch, particularly for a double crochet. Um, and then you can put a stitch marker in the top of that chain three. And then when you come back around and have to slip stitch or work into it, you can kind of pull up on that stitch marker and create that extra space that can be so hard to get into sometimes at the top of those chain threes. So I hope that answered that. Um, was there another question? I think I saw one come up. Yep, there's another question. Tips, uh, tri uh, Laura Collard is asking, tips or tricks for tension when cro uh, crocheting articles of clothing so things don't come out so big. She said that most of the things she's made have come out really huge oh. and she's reduced her hook size, but it's still, it doesn't seem to come out quite right. Okay, well, that is a fantastic question and there could be several answers. Sounds like you've tried changing hook sizes, which is a great, great way to um, try to tackle that. I'm gonna come back to that here in just a second because I just wanna point out, I've come to where my stitch markers were in that first round. So I'm gonna work in that first marked stitch, which would have been the last stitch. And now I can get that one out and just set it aside, use it later. But I know that's going to be our slip stitch there so that I can just come right over to our first marked stitch. So that's why I left those in there. So that way I didn't accidentally work into that slip stitch right in between. Once I've worked into those two, I can just set that right aside. There we go. There, a little easier to see. Okay, so back to tension. Um, so yeah, moving hook sizes is a great way to go. When you're working garments is when it's really important to try and match the gauge listed in the pattern. Uh, most gauges, particularly patterns for garments, things you have to wear, things that really need to fit, so to speak, should have a gauge listed in the pattern. So for this hat, it's 15 half double crochets and 13 rows equals four inches. So that means if you make a little swatch that size or a little bigger, ideally, and then measure it, four inches would be 15 stitches across, four inches would be 13 rows tall. So when you're making something, for instance, like a blanket or a washcloth gauge, you know, I mean, it, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter so much, right? Because if our blanket ends up a couple inches wider, that's usually a good thing. Um, you know, nobody's ever said this blanket is far too large. Um, so when we go to garments though, that's where it can be more important. So matching the gauge in the pattern is ideal. Changing hook sizes can be really helpful for that. Um, additionally, you want to make sure a problem that a lot of people have is that 
they'll start a garment being really tense and nervous because, you know, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I don't understand. What do I do next? I'm there. I get it. <laughs> Same way when you're designing them too. And then as we continue and we settle in and say, oh, okay, I got through the tough part. Now I've got, you know, 40 rows of single crochet or whatever. Then we relax. So the first part of that piece will be really tight while we're concentrating. And then the rest of it will be a little more open and relaxed. This can happen at two when we're making the gauge swatch. If we make the gauge swatch one night while watching a horror film and then, you know, make the actual piece the next night uh, while we're watching a comedy, we're going to end up with two different sizes. So what I recommend is that you really want to try to relax from the beginning. And I know that can be difficult, but remember crochet is supposed to be pleasurable and try and sit down. When you go to sit down to crochet, make sure Stretch out your hands a little bit if you need to, to relax them, relax your elbows, really relax your neck and shoulders. That's where we hold a lot of our tension and it can end up in our stitches. Um, additionally, what can help with that is working in a chair with good armrests, or if you don't have that, put a couple pillows, let your arms rest on the pillows. Um, I've often wished I kept my boppy when my kids, from when my kids were little, because that would have been perfect just to rest my arms on right there and crochet. So anything you can do to minimize, you know, those sort of effects on your tension can be really helpful. And the other thing to do is I want you to notice how I've got my yarn tensioned here in my hand. It's also a little bit loose. When I get to the point where I'm working out of the skein like this, I will stop and pull up a couple yards, a couple feet, depending on what I'm making, um, and make sure that I'm controlling the tension from the yarn itself that I'm not letting the ball or the cake or the skein affect the tension, that I'm not letting that create tension on there because then that can start shrinking my stitches. And then when I control it, it's looser again, shrink, loose, shrink, loose. Additionally, the one final thing as I begin round two here, and or excuse me, I should say rounds 10 through 18, which are all the same, chain two and half double crochet in each stitch around is Watch how you make your stitches. Now, I wanted to make these two really tight, so I held on to my yarn really tightly, and I might have even just pulled back a little bit as I made that stitch. However, as I go to make the rest of my stitches, I'm going to let this yarn gently flow through my fingers. You can, after you make a stitch, let it sit there, or you can find yourself pulling back on it like this. If you pull back like this, this is going to make your stitches really tight. On the other hand, let me pull that one a little bit looser there. I'm going to go ahead and pull that one out. Look at that. Look how beautifully that frogs. So nice. All right. On the other hand, some people, when they go to make their stitch, will pull their loop way up high. Look at that. I pulled that loop all the way up here before I even yarn over and pull through. So now I've got a really tall half double crochet. That might be part of what's happening to you. Instead, not that either one is wrong, but instead it's ideal to sort of try and pull it up just a little bit, not necessarily all the way like you would for a puff stitch, which you might do intentionally, but for this one, we'll pull up just a little yarn over and pull through and just sort of let it ride right there. That's sort of the in-between. So if you are somebody who finds that your stitches tend to be too tall, Maybe you need to pull back just a little bit, not pull those loops up quite so high. On the other hand, if you're someone who finds that your stitches tend to be too tight, it could very easily be that you're pulling back on that yarn with each stitch. Now, the final thing I will mention as a possibility that could be affecting your tension is the actual yarn. Now, I do it myself all the time. I don't know a crocheter who doesn't. Sometimes we follow the yarn instruct, you know, recommended by the pattern. Sometimes we grab a different yarn for a pattern like this. You of course really want to have this specific yarn, but for other patterns, you might say, well, gosh, you know, I don't have X, Y, Z yarn. So I'm going to use this yarn I have over here or what's available to me locally. And that's fine, but it can make a big difference. For instance, um, let's just say, for example, like polyester yarn versus something like alpaca. Um, polyester is going to react one way to weight and being wet and being blocked is going to pretty much hold its shape. 
Whereas something like alpaca, when you crochet with that and then you go to block it, which means basically getting it wet and letting, letting, letting it lay flat to dry, uh, that will grow tremendously. Um, learned that the hard way myself. It will uh, expand and grow quite a bit. So if you are substituting the yarns, you'll also want to pay attention to the fiber because the designer, especially with something like a garment, may have taken into account how much they expect that garment to grow with gravity when you put it, pull it on, put it on. <laughs> I'm having trouble talking today. When you put it on, that weight can really pull it down and uh, add a lot of weight and length to the garment. So if you, you're having trouble with things being oversized, um, check your you know, how you're holding your yarn, check what your yarn is made of. And then finally, you might want to go back and just check your measurements and make sure that you are making the size that you actually want to make. Um, some garments come with a lot of positive ease, which means a lot of room, so to speak, in the chest. And some are meant to be a little tighter and form fitting. So you may need to just take a look too at how that garment is meant to fit. And even if you normally say wear a size um, large or something, you may want to take your actual measurements and see how they compare to the measurements that the designer is using. Um, we also had two other questions. We mm -hmm. had, um, do you put the marker in the chain or the actual first stitch? I believe I saw you putting it in the first stitch. Yes, yes. This in this project. case, in this case, you'll want to put it in the actual first stitch. Now, be that's because we're not using, and come back here to the beginning of the round, we can see it. We're not using that chain two as a stitch. It's just a turning chain. We don't want to mark it because we're not using it. We're not paying. Once it's there, we ignore it. It's nothing. We come right to that first stitch. Now, if that chain two was counting as our first stitch, then I absolutely would have put the stitch marker in the top of that chain two. So you can really, when it's your project, you can use your stitch markers however is most convenient for you. But for me, it makes the most sense to put them into the actual stitches. You could theoretically put them into stuff you want to avoid, whatever works for you. And you said there was one more? Yep. Um, the other question was, does using half double versus double crochet uh, change the size of your hat? Yes, it absolutely will. Um, you can see I've come to that last stitch, marked stitch. I'm going to move my stitch marker right on up to the stitch I just made. Uh, yes, double crochets are taller than half double crochets. Now your half double cro your double crochets might be taller and shorter than mine, but they're still going to be taller than your half double crochets, or at least they should be. So when you use double crochets instead, um, this multiple of ten is based on this being a half double crochet. If they were double crochets, it most likely, most likely, <laughs> would have started with a multiple of around twelve, possibly sixteen, but most likely twelve, and then we would have gone twelve, twenty four, thirty six instead of 10, 20, 30. So when you've got a taller stitch like that, it can affect primarily right here. If you wanted to switch to double crochet for the work even section, you could absolutely do that. You'd probably just work fewer rows. So it would affect the size, but you could get away with it on the sides where you're just working even if you wanted to. Alrighty, so we've got 10 minutes left. <coughs> But excuse me, but I have shown you just about everything we're doing here. We're just making half double crochets. We've seen that we're working in the back loop only. We've seen that when we come to our finished hat here again, remember, we're working top down to so work our flat circle right now. We're working in our even rows. So again, you could really honestly use whatever stitch you wanted to right here. You would just want to change the number of rows that you get about this height. I. Uh, do not have a tape measure too handy, do I? No, I don't. I thought I had a tape measure handy, but I'd estimate this is about three and a half to four inches right there. So really, however tall you want your hat to be before you switch over to the brim. The brim section starts in the 19th round. And it's the same thing. We just work into that back loop only like we were doing before, but then we go back to increasing to create that flare. So just like we would occasionally work an additional stitch up here to get it to make our nice flat circle, we do the same thing at the bottom right here, where we just work several stitches and then two stitches, several stitches and then two stitches, working our way out to create that flared brim. 
So I saw somebody ask to show the color change again. So let's go ahead and do that right here. We're going to pretend again on our tiny, tiny little hat that I have finished this round. And this is all the height we want for our hat. So I will go ahead and cut that yarn with my scissors. Again, we want to leave about four to six inches. That's the ideal length for weaving back in. Then you can just finish off that yarn however you like. I like to just pull up on it and then weave it in securely, but however you prefer. And I'm going to, since I've already got two skeins or two cakes started here, I'm just going to go back to my first color. Again, you can come up with whatever color way you want for yours. And then I'm just going to find a spot on the hat that I want to join to. Take a close look. We've got to look for that front loop and our back loop only. Go ahead and put your hook right under that back loop only. Get that really centered there. There we go. And then I can put that down for a minute while I get my next color all sort of set up in my fingers and ready to use. Pick that right back up. Drop that loop on top of my hook. And pull it right on through. Then I'm going to go ahead and just make my chain two. One and two. And now it's nice and secured right on that loop. We've got that tail end hanging out there. And then we can just start crocheting right into that same stitch that we joined to. Now you'll notice that pulls up really far and that seems like it's wrong, right? You've got too much daylight there. It's fine. It will all settle down as you continue to work into the other stitches around it. So we put our half double crochet right there in that same stitch. And then we mark the top of that stitch right there, right in those top two loops. You can see it's right next to the loop coming out. That's where I want to put my stitch marker. And then if we're going on to the 19th round, we start with a half double crochet in the next 14 stitches before we work two half double crochets in the stitch after that. So we're just spreading out our increases that much more but still increasing to create a little bit of flare. Was there another question I could answer? Yes, actually, speaking of the flare, uh, mm -hmm. Angela says, I have trouble getting the brim to flare. What causes that usually? Okay. Well, um, hmm. it could be that you are missing your increases, not increasing enough, possibly not working enough rounds to see it show up. These increases are pretty far apart. If we look at the finished hat, we've got one here and it looks like in this round, the next one is probably about over here. So you can see those first few rounds, they, it isn't gonna be flaring very much at all. If I lay this out flat, just a little bit. As you continue, that will become far more obvious. Um, another thing may be if you were more relaxed and now you're pulling your stitches a little tighter, you know, it's a, it's a longer project, you might've put it down and come back to it. And, you know, something happened. If you're working a little tighter down here than you were up here, you might not be getting that flare. Um, and if you want more of a flare, let's say, oh gosh, you know, it's flaring, but just not enough for me. I wish it was really sticking out there. Increase the number of increases. You can, instead of, let's come back to our written instructions here for round 19 and get that centered. It says half double crochet in each of the next 14, then two in the ones after that. Maybe you just increase in the next seven and then add an increase. You can always throw in more increases to change that flare if you'd like. If you don't want it to flare, if some reason you wanted your bucket hat to be a little more buckety, completely straight, uh, then you could take out those increases and just keep working evenly with your third color to keep it straight. So it's the number of increases that will determine how much it flares. So if it's just the first couple rows and you're not seeing very much flare yet, you might just need to give it a little more, um, a few more rows so that you can have more increases in there. Um, otherwise, you can always throw in a couple more increases yourself to really get it to flare more widely if that's the look you're going for. Was there anything else I could answer here? I'm going to let Laura look. Looks like. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> We're good. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, yeah, make our little continue on our little version of the hat here for our last few minutes. If you think of another question you want to ask before we run out of time, now's the time to put that in the chat. But let's see here on our little guy, let's say I really wanted to increase those, um, that flare. I would work a few stitches and then go ahead and put an increase in there. 
The main thing is to try and spread those increases around evenly. So you can use stitch markers to help you plan that. You can lay it out and really just lay out those stitch markers where you want those increases to be. That could be another great use for those. Um, and really just have some fun with it. Remember, if you don't like it, if you say, oh gosh, this isn't working, you can always just pull your stitches right on out. Now we've got a spot where I can really pull on those. You can see just how easily this yarn comes out. Such a joy to work with be able to have a yarn that has all this texture and fuzz to it, but is still incredibly easy to work with. And it's got these really lovely colors. We didn't get a chance to see this one in action. This one is the fuchsia colorway. I had to read that upside down. Um, but I, the other thing I wanted to point out is that these are very large cakes. I forgot to mention that earlier. 481 yards in each one of these cakes. So you could probably get two possibly three hats out of just one cake if you wanted to if you're somebody who does craft fairs um or you know bulk gifting things like that um then this one of these cakes does go a really long way and if you get three i can only imagine how many hats you would be able to get out of that as well so were there any other questions i could answer here while we have just a couple of minutes left Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, going through the pattern, there is a page two. So if you're getting a hold of the written pattern, don't forget that. Just want to go ahead and point that out. And we can see as we continue whoop, down here, we kind of get right back into that pattern. 20th round, 90, 21, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140. So we get back to increasing by 10 stitches around. So that kind of gives you some experience. If you haven't made something in the round before or with these flat increases, this hat will teach you a lot of the little tricks and things in how hats are made and give you a really good basis to how to make all kinds of hats in the future. So I guess um, if that is it, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, just a couple minutes left here. I want to be able to thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I've been Tamara Kelly from Moogly. And once again, if you want to find this pattern, it is the Karen Fuzzy Stripes Crochet Bucket Hat featuring Karen Coconut Cake Yarn. So thank you so much for having me today, and I'll turn it back over to Laura. Okay, thank you for joining us, everyone, for this live community classroom with Michaels. Don't forget to share your projects with either hashtag Make It With Michaels or hashtag Yarnspo. That's Y-A-R-N-S-P-O. Um, and you can find more classes on the Michaels website and the recording of today's class will be available on Michaels YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great